Hello, everyone. This is Dr. David Lieberman. I hope you're well. As you can see, we're recording here from something that is uh, not exactly the official looking uh, place that the other uh, recordings are from. And that is because, unfortunately, I have COVID. Uh, Baruch Hashem, I believe I'm on the mend. Um, but as to not to infect anyone or to put anyone else at risk, um, I'm going to be recording this here myself. And also I give that disclaimer because I'm a little out of it. I'm on four different medications and three of them say may cause confusion. I don't know what the other two say. If you did the math, that was kind of funny. Um, but uh, we're gonna do our best to get through this because I wanted to do this for Project Inspire because what they do, what they accomplish, what they're doing with this campaign <coughs> is just extraordinary. I'll apologize again, not only for uh, the coughing, but also for sipping uh, while I speak. I think my wife put a tea bag in my vodka, but okay. And by the way, and if those of you that know some of my talks, you might feel that this is no different. All right, so we're speaking about positive parenting and psychological strategies that we can, <coughs> excuse me, this is going to be fun, psychological strategies that we can uh, use in our relationship with our children. And sometimes you're going to see a small thing can make a very big difference. Number one is this, you know, I'm going to speak a little more slowly and, and uh, we'll try and keep the coughing at bay. Always hear your child out. You know, it's very easy for us to have the reflex when your child comes to you and says, hey, can I do X, Y, Z? And you're thinking to yourself, there's no way, no how, in a million years, you're going to want your child to do that. But one of the most important things <coughs> to remember is that even when you have to say no to your child, you don't injure the relationship as long as you keep the connection. What that means is, is that sometimes parents think that, you know what, I'm gonna to have to say no to my son or my daughter, and in doing so, they're gonna be a little bit upset with me, this and that. You can actually enforce the relationship and reinforce the bond if you do it properly, meaning that it's not about what you say, it's about allowing your child to express how they feel to make sure that they feel heard. If in fact you short circuit them and they don't, you don't allow them to express themselves, when, they, when you say no, they have no idea of, uh, of they, 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 there's no way that they can know that you understand their pain. So if you're able to hear them out and you're able to empathize with them and validate and let them know that, wow, I get why this is important to you. And when you reach that critical point, they're going to know that the only reason you have to say no is if you have to. And that's, again, if you have to say no. But you'll find something interesting happens in hearing out your child. You know, you might just hear it. Maybe there's some sense. Maybe there's some room for compromise and so on. But the fastest way to injure a relationship with anybody is to short circuit their um, ability to be able to express themselves and to emote and to uh, to talk about what's on their mind or how they feel or what is it they want. And you know, there's a saying that a child that can't express themselves to their mother can't express themselves to an other. Um, and they say mother, meaning to a parent. So a child that grows up that, you know, that it feels unable to talk about how they feel uh, will often grow up feeling that they don't trust themselves. You know, one of the most, not one of the most, an injurious thing that a parent can say, and I heard it growing up and I don't think it affected me too badly, but everyone did is, you know, people would say, you know, uh, you know, uh, don't be so sensitive or you can't be hungry or you can't, you don't have to go to the bathroom, right? You know how many times, you know, your kids just get into the car uh, two minutes later, okay, you can't possibly have to go to the bathroom. Yes, maybe it's a ploy because they want to stop or it's before supper, uh, before bedtime and they say that they're hungry. You can't possibly be hungry, but you know, imagine if this were you and you know, you, you told your spouse that, you know, you were hungry and he or she said, you can't possibly be hungry. Now, okay, maybe you could roll with it, but as a small child, if they're told enough times that how they feel isn't true, they're being too sensitive, they're, they're, they're making a big deal out of nothing. Uh, they don't really have to go to the bathroom. They're not really hungry. They're not really, whatever it is, um, they learn that they can't trust themselves. So from an emotional standpoint, it's very, very important to allow the child to express themselves. From a relationship standpoint, it's critical in terms that allows that child to be able to know that you understand where they're coming from. And then again, if you can accommodate them, great. If not, fine. But once again, what's valuable is that they know that they feel heard. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Next. <coughs> 
excuse me, don't wait for a child to do something wrong before you let them know that this is something that is not acceptable. Now, I know it sounds counterintuitive because at what point are you going to criticize or rebuke a child for doing something if they're not doing anything wrong? You know, you know, they're sitting there, you know, minding their own business, you smack them on the head and say, what are you doing wrong? Um, it's not about that. It's, you know, if you want to work on a child with, with a particular uh, a trait, a meter, um, a characteristic, I know it's a, three words for the same thing, um, then, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> this is for Project Inspire because I love you guys. Chamomile and vodka. Um, whatever it is you're working on with the child, whatever it is you want to uh, ac accentuate and, and to bring out in the child, you want to call them out when they're getting it right. One of the biggest mistakes parents make is to point out when a child is doing something wrong when they're doing it wrong. For example, you know, uh, little Yosef has his hand in the cookie jar and you say, Yosef, what are you doing taking a cookie? You didn't ask mommy, daddy for permission or you said you weren't going to take one or your flesh, like whatever it is, the child is sitting there just feeling annoyed. But really, fundamentally, three very critical things happen. And by the way, we talk about this whole thing as a parenting series I have on Tarani Time, which I encourage you to check out as well. But the three things happen when you criticize a child in the middle of when they're doing something negative, okay? Um, well, number one, and by the way, this is true for anybody. It's not, not, not just for, for, for a child. Number one is they're angry at you, right? You're making them feel bad. Number two is they become angry at themselves. They feel guilty or shame, depending on the level of emotional uh, solvency, and they be begin to feel less good about themselves. But thirdly, most injuriously, is that they become, they, they begin to rationalize all the reasons for why it is that they're doing what they're doing. And they begin to justify it. They begin to rationalize it. They begin to explain it away. Um, and it reinforces their desire to actually repeat it. Because what they're thinking in their head is, wow, just wait till I get another chance to do blah, blah, blah. That's not how you move people forward. From a psychological perspective with our children, one of the best things you can do is to, to, um, to give over whatever Musa lesson it is when the child is doing it right. And even if he's not doing it right, as long as he's not doing it wrong, let's say you have a child who is constantly biting or hitting. And if it's an older child, hopefully that's not an older child, but if it's an older child, but let's say is uh, making fun of, a, of an in-law or a sibling or whatever it is, at any age, whenever the child is doing it, or rather they're, 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 they're not engaging that behavior. And there's a chance that they could have, okay, you know, the little boy walked by the cookie jar and it was, you know, young Kipper, so he didn't eat it, fine. Or he was already hungry, or he wasn't hungry anymore. Or the older person didn't hear, so whatever it is, you say, I just, that's when you say, I just want to sit, I want to let you know, I'm, I'm so proud of you. Not in a, wow, look who finally stepped up. Not like that, but generally, wow, that was magnificent. I, and then you, you go ahead and just illuminate what you saw. I saw that you had a chance to do X, Y, Z, hit your sister or make fun of so-and-so, and you chose not to do that. That's extraordinary. That really shows incredible, now bring out the meter, uh, uh, patience, uh, empathy, uh, whatever it is you want to accentuate, you connect with what it is that you observed. And we all have a desire to live up to a, a self image, to how other people see us, particularly our parents. You know, um, you know, someone can, can say to you, say, wow, uh, you know, you're such an amazing uh, homemaker, or you're such an amazing, you're so organized, or you're so punctual. Whatever it is that person says to you, it's amazing that we feel, even as adults, a, a innate drive to live up to that self-concept and to act in accordance with it. So if somebody calls us out as being somebody who is uh, always, um, you know, on time, for example, we're going to make it a point to make sure that when we see that person, we're on time. Or they come to our home and it just happens to be one of those days when it looks right. And they say, wow, it's amazing how you're able to keep such a beautiful home, even with all the kids around. When that person comes home, you're going to tidy up a little extra more. The reason why we bring this out is because by children, it's doubly so. Because their entire interface with how they see themselves is based on how other people see them. So it is critically important not to label, to call your child by a name 
that connotes anything other than amazingness. Um, you know, I mean, I have plenty of nicknames for my kids, superstar, masterpiece, um, you know, just positive names that evoke whatever it is that you want to bring out in the child. But when you call a child or say something like, wow, it doesn't have to be a name, but just a moniker, you know, a declaration of, you know, that's, oh, there's, there's my guy who never smiles. Or there's my, my, my daughter who, is, who we call her the sleeper. She sleeps in bed all day. Cute, funny, okay. It's not. It's not. The child will live up to that expectation because that is how they perceive themselves. That is how they see how you see them. And because children are egocentric, they see themselves how you see them. And they're going to live in accordance with that self-image. So you label a child as, ah, you know, you never do such and such. You always do this, blah, blah, blah. I, I'm telling you, it is got to be one of the most injurious things you can do. Again, we all grew up with this to some degree, in this generation. But, you know, this is a new generation. We have to go a little easier on them. So do what you can to mitigate that. All right. Um, regarding language, <coughs> excuse me. I apologize again. And I'm... By the way, you have to be careful with those oximeters, you know, the oxygen rating things. <laughs> I put it on my finger the other day and it was you know, 74, which is really not good. Um, but it was a low battery, which is better than, you know, me being at 74. Um, okay, so language is important. Uh, so what you call the child and also um, in two other areas. In, number one is and again, you know, these are psychological subtleties. There, there are things that can make such a profound difference um, in, in our child's health and certainly in our relationship with our child. And certainly it comes in handy in all our relationships and, and most definitely with ourselves as well. Um, how the child hears you use, use language and how you use language with your child. For example, parents will sometimes, <coughs> sometimes say to the child, um, uh, excuse me, I just want to make sure that we're, everything is, no, okay. Um, say to the child, um, wow, you must be overwhelmed, or uh, this must be, uh, you know, too much for you, something like that. All you're doing is inviting that child to consider the possibility that Hashem has given them more that they can handle. That's not a message you want to give your child or to yourself. And certainly when I speak to people individually and they say, I'm just overwhelmed, I encourage them to, um, to, uh, to rethink, there's a, there's a the better word for it, which I would have gotten last week, to, um, <clears throat> ah, anyway, uh, I, 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 I encourage you um, to, a train wreck in, uh, in, in real time, um, it, to, to reframe it, that's the word, to reframe it and, and to look at it differently because how you use language affects the brain. For example, when you say I feel overwhelmed, your brain doesn't know that you know, you just have the phone ringing and there's an omelet and that may be burning and, you know, somebody needs a diaper change. What the brain hears is overload, uh, trauma, tragedy, too much, something's going on, shut down. That's what it hears. Uh, so, you know, when you tell a child, you know, are you overwhelmed and they, they say, them, yes, no, there's no reason to lead with that. Better to reframe it and say, okay, fine. Uh, you feeling, how are you feeling, this and that. So, okay, it seems like you have a lot on your plate right now. What makes the most sense to be able to organize it, to structure it, to go through it? How can we move through everything in the way that makes the most sense? In much the same way that when you've got a lot of stress, there's a lot of things going on, you wanna make sure that how you speak to yourself, just a handy tip, um, uh, is in a way that allows for you to process what you're experiencing in the most calm way um, and the language is important. So when you say to yourself or you speak out if your kids are around, I'm overwhelmed, I can't do this, there's so much going on, you know, you're really not moving into solution mode with that. Better to say, take a breath, smile, let your children see that it's okay to just stop for a second, reassess, and ask yourself, okay, what is the most important thing I have to do right now? And go ahead and move forward and do that. But the, the language that we use is important because, let me give you an, an example. Let, let's say you walk outside and it, it's, you know, it's raining or it's snowy, or not, not snowy, it doesn't fit the example, it's just raining. And how many people walk outside and say, ah, it's miserable. 
or ah, what an awful day. Now, what you believe you're saying is that it's miserable weather, it's an awful day for doing something other than, I guess, getting wet. What your brain hears is, it's an awful day, it's a miserable day. And what your brain hears is what your children hear as well. My kids will tell you that we walk out, no matter what the weather is, it, it, if it's freezing, freezing, you know, our joke is it's, it's a little bit nippy. Um, but otherwise, well, an, an amazing day, no matter what, the, what an amazing day. And the weather happens to be a little schwach, happens to be a little rainy, a little overcast, but it's an amazing day. You know, it's interesting, <coughs> something called seasonal affective disorder, some of you may be all too familiar with it. <coughs> Excuse me. And seasonal affective disorder, sad for short, happens when, um, I mean, there's a number of factors, but basically it's the, the, the body does not produce enough vitamin D, which uh, it gets from sunlight. And, um, and low vitamin Ds can lead to uh, an affective disorder. Affective is another word for mood. So seasonal affective disorder, meaning the seasons affect our mood and we become a little bit blue a little bit down and there are a lot of range of different treatments for it, by the way the, the, the easiest is is vitamin d so you know i encourage you to take a look at that vitamin d3 um but what's interesting though is that just in parallel with the fact that you have seasonal affective disorder um when people are not out a lot and getting a lot of sunlight in the winter months that's also when the weather happens to be the most gloomy and we're also more likely to use language that you know gives ourselves a message that things are lousy, things are not looking good, they're overcast, they're yucky and so on. So once again, the language is very important. Okay, next, um, some lessons to take some, from video games. See how we're doing on time, I think we're good. Let video games, interesting. Why do kids like video games? I was just reading an article on uh, violence in video games, by the way, which is, you know, it's a, becoming a big problem. But video games um, have a couple interesting components. One is they move fast, but what happens is even when you get shot and killed, uh, you hit the reset button, you come back to life. Now, you don't come back to life after half an hour, right away. What we can learn from this <coughs> is that when your child does something at any age, like once again, even your spouse, there's so many overlaps here, we even I can use even ourselves. When we do something, you know, it's not quite right. You don't have to, with ourselves, you don't have to walk around with that, you know, gloom of, of, of pity, self pity and guilt and shame. And with somebody else, you don't have to stomp around and, you know, show that you're still a little bit resentful and you're still holding on to it. Be smart. Uh, aside from the fact it's electrically uh, mandated that once the person uh, at, at does proper truva or we've accepted it, whatever the age and the relationship is, that we let it go. Um, you know, you show your child that it is okay to be human, to make a mistake and to move forward. Um, but when the, you know, the child does something and they're, they're sorry and then you accept it, this and that, and they want to talk to you, I'm still, I, I still, that's not it. That's, they want, you need to do an instant reset, like the video game. How many kids would continue playing a video game if after they got shot and killed, uh, it took another 20 minutes to play again? They wouldn't, they'd go on to something else. So. No matter what your child did, as long as it's, you know, no, no, there's no, no one got shot and killed, let them just hit the restart button. Okay, fine. Doesn't mean that they don't apologize, don't take responsibility. If we have time, we get into how to do all that. But it does mean that there's no lingering resentment, which is very, very important because it shows your child that, that you're okay with the fact that they're not always going to be okay. You know, and this leads to something which is so, so important and so often misunderstood. <coughs> Excuse me. Your child cannot feel as if they have control over your emotions. Parents will sometimes say, you know, my, my, you, you make me angry or, you know, you make me upset. You make me so happy even. It's not that we don't want to let our children know that their behavior is consequences, but they really have to see you as impervious to being um, emotionally knocked off your, 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 your equilibrium. So when I say happiness, maybe that's not the best example. Certainly it's, it's great to, to, to let a child know that, wow, this is really exciting. This is, well, I'm, you know, I'm very proud uh, and so on. But the, 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 the fact that they would feel that they have control over your emotional space is very um, 
unsettling to them emotionally because they need to see that you as the parent as being a rock. Now, this is counterintuitive to some people or, or it's often misunderstood because they assume then that you, know, you walk around like being unaffected. It's not about that. Your child can do something that's wrong. You can you know, go through the proper steps of, of, of acknowledging the behavior and, and helping them to see you know, the, you know, the way to do tshuva and move forward without um, being out of control, without showing that you are angry, without showing that they pushed your buttons and moved you to an emotional space that's not healthy. One, it's not good for you. It's not good for relationship. But again, it undermines their own emotional security. It's a nuanced point, but very important. Okay. And then we start, we start by saying there's two interesting ideas about you know video games. And another one is... Um, the idea about just the the enthusiasm, the sounds and the the lights. And, you know, if you ever played a video, I'm not a big video game player. Then again, in, in my day, it was, those of you remember, was, you know, it was like Atari, like tennis, bing, 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 right? It's it's called hypnosis today. But, um, you know, I, it's, it's interesting. I, I got, um, I had a client I wanted to do a, just a quick cognitive test. So I, I, I downloaded a, a Boggle game. Boggle is a, it's a great word uh, search game where you, you know, spell out different words. I just wanted to see if they could do something. So anyway, I did it. And then the, the game was uh, on my phone. And once again, I'm, I'm not a big game guy. It's, it's not, it's not, I'm on some level. I just never got into it, but I had it. And for whatever reason, um, I found myself just, you know, with a few minutes um, as a waiting room somewhere. And, but of course, you know, the good doctor cannot be playing Boggle in, in, a, in a waiting room. So I turned down the sound. It was not fun. There, if you have the sound up and you play it, you hear things like, amazing, great job. You get seven letters, outstanding. With the sound off, nothing. It was not fun. And I found something so interesting about that. I mean, it's, it's, it's intuitive once you hear it. And I guess maybe I should have paid more attention to it before, but you know, there's a reason why we talk to small children using a lot of, you know, facial animation and expression and emotion. Um, but you're going to find something interesting that, you know, when you talk to your kids, you communicate to your kids, you know, sometimes it's hard to muster that energy. Um, but when you're <coughs> able to <coughs> really show enthusiasm, vocally so, amazing, great job, wow, that's terrific. I got news for you, it makes a big difference. So just something else to keep in mind. Okay, I think we have about another five minutes left or so. Um, let's see what we have on our list. Um, okay, so, <coughs> excuse me. All right. Um, simcha. Maybe we'll end with Simcha and then um, we'll get some oxygen. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, simcha, is, is, simcha is important because everything that we do gets charged with joy. It's very hard to, whether you're a leader in a business, uh, a sales manager, um, a parent to a child, or coaching a little league, or a Chavrusa wanting to you know, fire up um, you know, a Talmud, um, a Rebbe, whatever it is, the more joy you emanate, the more powerfully that message is communicated. Whenever you want to give over a lesson um, in Amuna, in Batachim, in Emes, um, in anything, do it with Simcha. You want to be able to charge with as much positivity as you can the entire experience of what it is that you are giving over and wanting that person to, to gain. That's one. Two with Simcha. The atmosphere itself in the house, I got to tell you, if there's one silver bullet, excuse me, bullet, <coughs> if there's one magic idea in Chinuch, in child raising, it comes from a psychological and certainly from a Torah perspective. It is to try to infuse the house with as much simcha as possible. And I would tell you, certainly during the, 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 the you know, I guess the first wave of COVID, the first you know, six, seven months, um, you know, I, I gave, I don't know, 
two, three, five hundred thousand Zoom talks on anxiety and children and dealing with the whole thing. And, you know, um, certainly what we model for our children is very important. And, you know, when, you know, you're, you're stocking up and, on, and tripping over boxes of, of toilet paper and tuna fish and you tell your children, don't worry, it'll be fine. You're sending a little bit of a mixed message. So be aware that, you know, your children are constantly picking up on, on what it is you do, not just on what you say. Um, but the idea about Simcha is so important, particularly during these times where, where you've got everyone in a lot of places still on top of each other. And I would say that the overarching, um, you know, a flow chart of whether or not you allow something in your house should be first, is this going to increase or decrease the Simcha in the house? Because from Simcha will stem a, a love for Judaism, a love for you, a love for themselves, for their sister, for life, for everything from a lack of simcha will just stem doom and gloom. So, you know, it you're not going to love a lot of the things that happen and choices that are made and things that go on, but these are new times and you really have to cut yourself a wide swath and a, and a lot more slack. Um, and give yourself a lot of credit too, because, you know, the I don't have to tell you, and I'd actually, I don't wanna go into just the amount of emotional health issues that are just wearing and tearing on people uh, emotionally, spiritually, physically. It, it, we're coming, too many people are coming apart at the seams, um, physically and metaphorically. It's just, it's, it's, it's devastating. So <clears throat> it's important to recalibrate our expectations. And I would encourage you to dial them all the way down to zero. Doesn't mean you don't have interest, doesn't mean you don't have wants, doesn't mean you don't have desires still. But as Rev Dessler once said at someone's uh, Sheva Brachas, when expectations begins, love departs. So uh, generally speaking, I encourage people to just dial your expectations down very low. And during these times, it just dial it all the way down to zero. Whatever happens, it's okay. Only the end of the world is the end of the world. And so in keeping with the theme of simcha and gratitude and trying to get um, a focus on the positive is look for the positive, look for the positive in your children, in yourself, um, in others, and you'll begin to see it. Um, you know, what we focus on becomes our reality. And it's very easy to get lost in a lot of the haze of a lot of, um, a lot of sadness, a lot of pain, uh, but there's also a lot of good, there's a lot of beauty and in our children, there's often also a mixed bag and some you don't necessarily, you know, like all the time, but you can always love all of them. And those times when you really find yourself at wit's end, you can still always have Rachmanis, you know, that's an a, a, a endless well that we can have for our children. Um, but more important than what you say to kids, end of the day is what you think of your children. So before you enter any conversation with your children, uh, remind yourself about who they are, how they were when they were born, you know, that special neshama, all the good that's there, and that whatever it is they're experiencing is for their tikkun, for their good, for their growth, as it is for yours. So ride the wave, focus on the good, love your child, and mir uh things will be good. I thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoy the entire Project Inspire convention. I thank you for putting up with my, my coughing and my um, sometimes uh, disjointed presentation. With that, wish you a good night. Thank you.